My name is Robert Cowherd and I am number four. I'm not the most important source of understanding. On a good day, I am the fourth most important source of understanding, like your other instructors. I have to explain that because it's confusing. I'm here in one side of the space and you're in, facing me. So it can be confusing. The architecture sends a message because of the position of your bodies and the position of my body. It sends the message, <clears throat> I'm important. And it plays into the unfortunate model of education, the dysfunctional model of education that some of you may have experienced uh, in your earlier lives, that you are empty vessels and we are the source of understanding and we fill up your emptiness. That is not true. It didn't work out very well in the past generations. Uh, let's do the opposite. The number one source of understanding is the world itself. And I'm gonna try not to say anything that I can't show you uh, in using the evidence of the world itself. I'm gonna fail at that task. And so it, it's going to become your job to fill in the holes. It's gonna be your job to check the evidence and make sure that I'm not making claims that are not supported by the evidence. I'm sorry for any claims that I make that are not supported by the evidence. And uh, I pass it on to you. It's your job to figure out what's right here and what's not right. As I said, I'm number four, right? Um, the second most important source of understanding is seeing the world through the tools of architecture. We have a privileged access access to the understanding of the world because we can cut sections and we can see things from impossible viewpoints and plan and section and axonometric. We have a privileged access to the lessons that the world has to teach. And that's number two, architecture itself. Number three are your colleagues. They will teach you more than any of your instructors. And then we do the best we can but even on a good day, we're number four. The corollary to this is that it's important not to let your school get in the way of your education. So we start the process, we get you up, we do the best we can. And I think we do about as big as any school of architecture can do. Um, uh, we, we take it up to the point where we can, and then you have to take it the rest of the way. So consider all of this to be seeds of further, for seeds uh, planted uh, for you to follow up on in this studio, in your digital representation class. There's a, there's a very direct challenge for you embedded in this to follow up on in your digital representation. Uh, I hope you will pick up the ball and take on this challenge uh, this semester and in your years here at Wentworth and into your careers. I think there are several hundred uh, students who have heard some version of this talk uh, in past years. I realized this morning when I went to open up my, uh, my older version of the talk that there is no older version of the talk because I used a piece of software that no longer exists, so I recreated it as quickly as I could. So sorry if it's a little messy, but I discovered a whole bunch of new set of resources in the process. So I'm very excited to give this talk. Um, the first image you'll recognize, I took it moments ago, walking on my way to the lecture hall. Um, how do you experience architecture? Uh, that's the first question. And uh, because the topic of this talk ostensibly is the human scale, uh, there's a hint there. We experience architecture through the same means that we experience most everything else, through our phones. I mean, through our bodily experience, not through our phones. Even when we're experiencing the world through our phones, there is a bodily uh, 
relationship between your phone and your eye, brain, body system, which is a singular system. Um, so the first issue here has to do with the human scale as the source measurement of all human experience. First and foremost, we experience the world through our bodies. We experience our bodies and we experience everything else through those bodies. It's not just the eye. We tend to favor visual access and visual experience of the world, but we as architects know with absolute clarity that the eye is just part of the whole experience. That's part of the reason why we're glad we're all here in Blount rather than doing this by Zoom. That there's more bandwidth when your body-mind system is present. Uh, uh, there's so much more going on than just the visual experience of this. Uh, and so uh, this body-mind uh, experience is something that is embedded in architecture as uh, the key relationship to the built environment. And so uh, we have always venerated a, a very direct knowledge of the human body in relationship to the world. What's wrong with this picture? Um, I'm speaking of the one on the left. It's a very specific human body and it, for the longest time, again, I'm referring to mistakes made in the past that we are correcting, as in you are correcting in the present century. This is a white male uh, who is 183 centimeters tall. And this ideal is not universal. And we've moved on to something that is universal. Our, aspires to be universal called universal design. And it, it started, uh, you may have heard of universal design in terms of curriculum and teaching and learning, uh, but it started in architecture. Uh, it started with handicapped accessibility, which is a minimum requirement. And quickly we moved on to universal design, which is a, uh, an optimistic aspiration that is part of the ethical standards of architecture. The history of this goes back to the body as a metaphor for all architecture. Uh, that was a very prominent uh, aspect of the relationship of the human body to what we do. Uh, and then the human body as the measure of all architecture uh, was not invented by Corbusier. Um, it's interesting to note that even when there are highly standardized ratios, uh, the golden ratio, uh, specifically, uh, that relate directly to the human body, the outcome is anything but uh, plain, orthogonal, predictable. There's nothing predictable about Ronchamp, despite the fact that in every dimension, Corbusier uses uh, his modular system based on the human dimensions. Uh, indigenous cultures all over the world throughout history have used the the size of the owners of the house, the patron of the architecture, sets the scale to which the architecture is then built. And this is common across the world uh, throughout time and st is still happening in some societies. Um, this is uh, an important source uh, that brought a very direct understanding of the human body experience at a time when it was not something uh, that students were encouraged to engage in. Uh, this came out of Yale's first, uh, first year program in its architecture school. And uh, it very much builds on uh, a careful uh, consideration of how we experience uh, space. And it moves on, as you see in this uh, quick sketch, how, not just how the individual experiences uh, space, but how um, groups of people or more than one individual engage within space like we are doing right now. Believe it or not, and this is gonna be hard for you to believe, uh, there was a time 
uh, maybe it's not so hard to believe because it still happens a little too often now. There was a time when architectural drawings and architectural photography very specifically avoided humans in its representations uh, because it was thought to distract us from the architecture, from the, from the architectural form. And so this was all but a hard and fast rule in architectural photography for decades that just, you know, can you get out of the picture? I'm trying to take a picture of the architecture. Please remove yourself. The other thing that was odd is that uh, architecture, architectural representation and photography would avoid uh, capturing the context uh, that would also uh, distract us from the purity and glory of the architectural form. Uh, this happens to be a piece of architecture that um, is wholly and entirely dependent on its site for its operation. This is not uh, on a street with a sidewalk and people driving by and people walking by. There's actually um, a six foot high stone wall about, uh, I guess about 80 feet behind where the photographer is taking this picture from. Um, actually, you might be able to see it in the reflection there. Uh, but it's, it's wholly and entirely dependent for its operations, for its success on the site context. So an understanding of this building outside of the site is uh, really an incomplete picture. It's very rare, like uh, try to find a picture of this building set in its site. It's almost unheard of. And then um, there are still, uh, a whole team of a whole group of architectural uh, renderers who are committed to going back in history. And instead of doing photography of famous uh, architecture, they do architectural renderings using the same software you guys are or will soon be using. Uh, these are produced with V-Ray um, and other 3D Max and other uh, software platforms. These are not photographs. These are architectural renderings, carefully produced uh, without people. <clears throat> and when, uh, but when in doubt, when we don't have access to people, uh, there's the furniture. So even without the people, having furniture is a really powerful way to get at the human scale and how relationships between the human body and the uh, architectural form, how that interplay might, might be experienced. Um, and so this brings us to the core question of why do we want to put people in our architectural drawings? Why put people in our models and our renderings? Uh, the second most important reason to do it uh, might be that it, it just looks better. But the number one reason has to do with the design process itself. I would say that putting people in our representations right from the first sketches is crucial uh, in order to test every sketch, every drawing, every view that we produce in the process of developing an idea for architecture with the human body or multiple human bodies in that sketch has the important purpose of testing to see what it might be like. And we do that by projecting ourselves into the space of that model or of that drawing so that we can occupy the position occupy the uh, orientation uh, of that human body that's being represented as a method for as directly as possible imagining our experience. And by doing this, we can test for the results. We can say, this is working uh, for these reasons, or this is not working so well uh, for what reasons. And it gives us the ability to critique our own work the best 
critical experience is not the desk crit. Remember, we're number four. We show up on uh, Wednesdays and Fridays, but most, let's face it, most of the design work is happening between Friday and Wednesday, between Wednesday and Friday. When you need a, a critical voice most, where are we? We're at home. We're number four. Do not depend on us. In the meantime, if you're smart and you're working in studio, you are surrounded by uh, collaborators, potential collaborators, number threes, who can help you out. But what do you do when there's no studio uh, space for you to be working in? You, do, uh, you go to number two, uh, which is the drawing itself. Your method of representation is the most important tool for getting critical feedback, not your teacher. So don't wait for Wednesday to roll around before you take your next move. Uh, do the drawing, draw a person into the drawing, and then ask that person, they, what do you imagine that person uh, is experiencing? And this gets to the number, one of the top uh, ethical responsibilities of all designers, which is empathy. It's so important that it's made it uh, into the number one slot in Dan Brown's uh, design thinking that is not, uh, it's not that big a deal in architecture because it's all, it's all sounds obvious to us. We've been doing this for centuries. But uh, when Dan Brown gave his TED talk in 2009 and then wrote a book, uh, it really took uh, the rest of the world, the non-design world by storm to the point where the business school at Stanford University rebranded itself. And they announced a few years later, stop calling us the B school. We're not the B school, call us the D school. They identified the single most important set of methods for making decisions in the business world, in the world of organizations in the 21st century. They said design thinking is the most important basis for collaborating and making decisions moving forward. And so uh, this is something that when you uh, graduate, you go out into the world, maybe you'll be architects, but even if you're not architects, you can claim to have been trained in design thinking at its source in the world of architecture and design. And uh, your value as a design thinker will uh, be appreciated. Um, and keep in mind, first and foremost, empathy. So now we're gonna go a little deep into art theory and the history of landscape painting where there's a, there's a 19th century uh, principle that the reason we enjoy landscape painting, the way we experience landscape, uh, landscapes in, in front of the picture plane is that we're capable and we naturally do this. We project ourselves into the scene. And this is called, this is uh, a word that, uh, you probably have never heard of before, but it might be useful as you move forward. It's called a haptic uh, experience. It it's has to do with the sense of touch. Again, it goes beyond the visual because the mind-body system is not just uh, the visual sense, but it's also the position of your body, the experience of walking through space across a landscape. And so this is the idea that drives an awful lot of architectural rendering. Uh, as, as we move forward, this idea is an important one to, to refer to. And so um, not all uh, the, the, the myths, the two myths that I've presented here were not ubiquitous. Um, thankfully, there was plenty of uh, architectural photography and architectural representation that included human bodies that gave us something uh, that we, that who could receive our projections. But even if uh, these models were not posing in the photograph, this famous photograph of the Case, case House 22 uh, by Peter Koenig, uh, even if those models were not posing there, the furniture 
would give us a hint. It would be an invitation for us to project ourselves because we're architects. We're more capable than most people, hopefully, of projecting ourselves into the picture, into those bodies, and if there are no bodies, onto that furniture, so that we can imagine and empathize our way to understanding what is working about the architecture and what is not yet quite working. And so I'm going to show, um, I don't know how many photos by Iwan Bon. Iwan Bon is probably the most prolific, most, uh, he's the go-to architectural photographer uh, of the last two, two decades. And um, he has uh, come to prominence in part by famously, by, by his telling, he famously uh, breaches both of those two taboos that, um, that I referred to previously. Instead of saying, I'm an architectural photographer, he claims that he is a portrait photographer and that he is deeply influenced by famous portrait photographers uh, of the last uh, century. And uh, he says he just prefers to take his photographs of people in rarefied, uh, charged, uh, well, you know, well-designed architectural spaces and, and environments. And so here's a series of his photos uh, where he captures the singular human form within the context of an architecture. And many of these, and this is kind of uh, a scavenger hunt for you, many of these, uh, if the human figure were not in these uh, images, which ones would you know, uh, would you have a sense of, of the scale of these spaces and which ones, uh, you know, which one includes familiar landmarks that would give us a sense of scale and which ones are devoid of that? So this one uh, is number one. Here's another one, extremely abstract, powerful formal spaces with a single human figure, which becomes the only source of a sense of scale and our only, uh, our only stepping stone to experiencing that or imagining what it might be like to be in this space. The path itself gives a sense of scale, but the figure helps even more. Very famous photo. More stairs. And notice the use of blur. This is going to come up uh, in what I challenge you with the end of the lecture, towards the end. The use of blur to convey a sense of motion that activates the space even further. And spaces that don't work well at all, you can tell. This person, I suspect, at least when I project myself into this space, I don't envy her. When I empathize, when I project myself uh, into her position, I'm like, eh, not so great. Ooh, yikes. Ah. And then we get into groups of people, groups of people moving. Some of these people are stationary and some of them are in motion. And this becomes an important factor. Um, this is related to some of the diagramming that was done a few weeks ago. Uh, you may have drawn a line in your plan that said this is the circulation, um, but I think we can do better. If uh, the only purpose of drawing that circulation diagram with a single line, if the purpose is to uh, satisfy a minimum requirement for a studio assignment so that you can put a check mark next to it, then it's fine. Go ahead, draw a single line. But if you're trying to get an insight into whether the design is working and why it's working, or whether a design is not working as well as it could be, then I recommend putting the human body into the representation. 
Moving on to uh, taboo number two, don't show the context. Uh, Iwan Ban was one of the first people who, uh, who purchased a drone for architectural photography. And when he was commissioned to uh, capture this uh, community center by Michael Maltzen, who, by the way, graduated from Wentworth, uh, this is what he produced. And especially considering the, the, the purpose of this center is to serve the needs of a historically underserved community of homeless individuals, uh, this uh, photo actually uh, depends on its context for our ability to evaluate its relative success or failure. Dubai which I think is a sharp criticism of the whole thing, myself. Uh, the floating city in Lagos, uh, he tells the story of the drone in this shot um, plummeted into the water and uh, it was several thousand dollars uh, lost. Um, famous uh, aerial photograph of Hurricane Sandy that was put on the cover of New, uh, New York Magazine. Uh, when lower Manhattan was plunged into darkness um, with the effects of rising sea levels and climate change. The High Line. And this photo that will uh, come up again later uh, when we look critically at uh, uh, urban space and how important the human scale is, um, we'll see uh, this, a similar view without the birds and the people. And even the work of Zaha Hadid, who takes great pride, her firm takes great pride in uh, unabashed beauty uh, generated by bold forms. Uh, he, he actually is capable of humanizing these sculptural uh, blobs uh, by framing it in the urban context and uh, letting the people roam freely in capturing that experience. Chandigarh, India, famously inhospitable to humans uh, because of the vastness of the space around it. But here's a quite humanized view that makes it look um, actually quite, uh, quite uh, humane. Here's that view of the, um, the large space uh, in front of this building in Brasilia, uh, famously out of scale uh, compared to humans, um, which brings us to um, the, the thinking of Jan Giel, that's how you pronounce it, from Copenhagen. Uh, if you've heard of Copenhagen uh, in the last uh, several decades in relationship to design, it's probably in part because of the efforts of a team of people uh, led by Jan Giel to transform the city of Copenhagen from uh, something like an American city dominated by automobiles uh, and uh, into something much more human scale. Um, some of the studies about human scale and its effect on uh, cities and neighborhoods has to do with competition between humans walking at their pace uh, in their lane, uh, the sidewalk, in competition with traffic, which comes in uh, to this uh, storyline um, quite powerfully. Um, Jan Giel is famous for saying, um, you should not start with the buildings that doesn't work out so well. Uh, you need to start with the people and uh, design the buildings around the people. There is a film called The Human Scale, and uh, it features the efforts uh, of Jan Giel and others to reclaim the scale of places in modern cities uh, around the world. Uh, they, their team has been invited uh, to Chinese cities. They have offices in New York and San Francisco, not just in Copenhagen. And they are very much part of this reclaiming of, of space for humans.
Um, we don't really have time to go deep in this. I just want to plant another seed that some sociological thinking places uh, a great deal of importance on the relationship between the human body and the built environment. So much so that uh, uh, this one uh, sociologist claims that uh, we, well, to paraphrase the famous uh, quote from Winston Churchill, first we make our buildings and then they make us. And I don't know if you've heard that, but it's worth thinking about as you design that we make the buildings and uh, once they're built, they have an impact on how we experience not just the lecture, but um, the whole experience of Wentworth is mediated by the experience of this room for better or worse. Um, is it too cold again? Is the HVA system too loud? Is the one and a half second reverberation time of a room make it difficult for you to hear? Uh, what the speaker is saying. All of these things uh, are part of uh, how we engage the world. It uh, goes, uh, Bourdieu goes so far as to say that its structures are our position in the world. We are uh, free agents, but the decisions that we make are limited by the built environments that we that have been created and that we have inherited. And so it's a very interesting uh, idea that came out of his uh, research in the 60s. Um, and uh, it goes, uh, it reaches down to the heart of the ethical, uh, the ethics of the architectural profession, which has recently been adjusted to uh, really require that we do not engage in the design of certain human built environment relationships that are directly harmful to human life, including prisons. Um, a quick note on uh, where we get those people that we put in our renderings. For decades, uh, the white male dominant culture of architectural profession, not surprisingly, uh, looking for very attractive people to put into our renderings, chose uh, the people from uh, this very free uh, and easy and available uh, site uh, uh, that uh, produced these scale figures uh, located in Scandinavia. So they tend to be Scandinavian figures populating our architectural renderings uh, until um, several years ago, uh, a group of students, really graduate students in New York said, eh, we can do better than this. And so they, uh, they produced and made available for free and uh, you, can, you have these available to you now. But uh, a, a, a collection of human scale figures that, uh, avoid the harm done by excluding those uh, who um, don't look like the white male architects that used to dominate uh, the profession. And so uh, when we look at the art of rendering and how to place people and placing people who actually reflect the larger spectrum of humanity, um, it's interesting to note that it works. Um, is this a great building that invites us to, uh, to feel joy? Um, not so much. Imagine this picture without the people in the foreground. Uh, it works. Some architects uh, have uh, been very directly taking up the challenge that I've presented to you, that uh, we can and should uh, develop our architecture. We, don't, we shouldn't just wait till the end and throw some uh, appropriate figures in the rendering in the last stage. Right from the beginning, we need these people in our drawings so that they can tell us 
uh, by imagining their experience, they can tell us what it's like to be in the spaces that we are proposing. So in order to do this better, uh, architect David Rockwell, who has uh, done a lot of Broadway set design, uh, invited his, uh, his friends and collaborators from Broadway, uh, the choreographers, uh, to look at uh, different architectural spaces and try to understand what it is that people are experiencing, how are they moving through the space, what is this negotiation between the decisions people make, the agency they have within the structured space, the habitus of uh, specific spaces. And um, they, it was a very primitive uh, method using um, Sharpies and, and eight by 10 photographs. Uh, and this is the outcome. And the, the project, the commission that uh, triggered this was uh, an airline terminal at John F. Kennedy Airport. And uh, he wanted to choreograph people's experience of the terminal, but not in a uh, A to B, only, there's only one line that's allowed. He wanted to create a space that invited engagement with the people moving through rather than the fun house experience of you go in this door, you walk this way in this sequence and you leave that door. Um, he wanted to choreograph it in a more negotiated way. And I couldn't find the outcome, but it's the process that I'm, I'm showing here. Um, the, this harkens back, and I'm sorry, I don't have the video of this, but William Hollingsworth White's book, The Secret Life of Small Urban Spaces, uses, uh, it's really a documentary film first and foremost. He uses uh, film technology in the 1980s to capture human behavior, human negotiations of space. This plaza up in front of uh, the Seagram building in Manhattan by Mies van der Rohe and Philip Johnson specifically. And it's a lighthearted, narrated, uh, but quite scientifically rigorous uh, observation of human behavior in space when people have options, they make surprising choices. Um, and so we have this book, the video is available. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a clip of it for you. Um, but uh, how should we be representing bodies in space? And uh, how? what are the tools for bringing humans into our architectural drawings as we are designing, not just at the end, that can give us the most useful feedback on how to develop the drawings, just as David Rockwell and his team were doing in the terminal design, what is the right way to be drawing? And one of the things that I've challenged students in the past to do is to use photography and video and computational tools to uh, achieve some of the things that have been achieved previously uh, in painting, in photography, um, especially things like this, where when humans are moving through a space, is there a way or what is the best way to capture that movement? Can't we do better than a line on the plan? Um, because these spaces are complicated. This is the work of uh, dancer, choreographer, William Forsyth. Uh, he was invited to be in residence at the University of Ohio Computer Science Department. And he challenged them to take the video input from one of his uh, famous uh, pieces uh, in the year 2000, um, recorded it uh, multiple from multiple angles, and then uh, had the computer science uh, team code it so it would transform it into these forms. Um, these are some Wentworth students who were attempting to reproduce some of these um, experiments and visualization, uh, but by Martin Romers, a Dutch photographer. Um, things are out of order here. Um, I'm not supposed to look at that. But Martin Romers, uh, is a photographer who gets up on a ladder 
and which is a crucial viewpoint, the axonometric or the elevated perspective view uh, for capturing the way humans move through space. And by using time-lapse photography, he's capable of distinguishing between humans who are uh, standing still and humans who are moving. And we used to do uh, a studio project for a market. And this distinction between going space and being space is actually crucial to uh, career success as an architect. When I go into uh, uh, someone's uh, space and they, they're hiring, they're thinking about hiring me uh, to help them change things, the number one thing that it turns out uh, opens up the opportunity to make significant change possible in an existing building is to immediately distinguish between the circulation space and uh, the space of being, the going space versus the being space. And every square foot that can be converted from going into being is, uh, is success. And sometimes there is a lot of circulation space available uh, that is redundant and can be converted quite successfully. So all of these uh, images are really about how do you do this? The trick is for roamers is he, you simply having tried to replicate this, it's simply not possible unless it's a very sunny day. Uh, it turns out that that is the secret of success of these time-lapse photos. Uh, but while I was coming to that conclusion, looking at, uh, I thought I was convinced that Romers was pulling a fast one. I was convinced that Romers was taking video, processing the video in Photoshop by capturing frames, and then using a difference filter in Photoshop to capture each body position as a separate frame. And I was ready to call him out online and say, this is not time-lapse photography. Um, but thankfully I never did that because I, I'm pretty sure it's time-lapse photography. But in the meantime, that was useful. It was a useful error because it allowed me to identify a way that we as architects, you as students could actually uh, take video of people moving and people not so much moving. This is a student uh, photograph. Um, this is another student photograph. Um, and we have yet to take full advantage of the digital tools that would uh, make it possible to really capture these spaces. Um, this should have been a little bit earlier in the in the show. This is what uh, the team at University of Ohio developed out of dance. And if we go forward, you can see the human body that is generating all of these forms. Um, I mean, this is, this is fun and everything, but uh, it's, it's a little too abstracted for our purposes. Uh, I think there's a lot that can be done uh, with this kind of uh, processing of video uh, data to help us uh, test our architectural proposals. This is a, a, a dancer who is also a painter who, because she was interested in the human bodily experience of movement through space and because of some life circumstances, also got a PhD in uh, neuroscience. So she's a brain, a brain surgeon, painter, dancer, uh, you know, typical. Of course, she ends up living in Cambridge because that's what brain surgeon, dancer, artists do. And uh, I was working with her on developing uh, some of these ideas. Uh, and she very powerfully makes the case that uh, there is no separation between 
the eye, the mind, and the body. It's all one system, which is confirmed by brain scans. Um, the body is not just something that gets our, our brains and our mouths to meetings and to class. Um, it's, a, it's a singular system and they work together. And it's very interesting in relationship to these topics. And she has uh, developed some of these tools, um, not, not really at the level of the University of Ohio, but in a way that's actually much closer to being useful to us. Um, using um, more mundane off-the-shelf tools uh, offered by the Adobe Creative Suite, which by the way, you have access to. And here, here's something that is, is interesting to consider, uh, especially if you think about how you might uh, capture the way someone uses a space that you're proposing and use this set of tools, which again is a very simple set of operations on Photoshop that I've never been able to figure out, but I'm sure you could. Um, but um, it, as a way to test the spaces and learn from how people move through space and occupy space. And I'm going to say that's the last slide. So um, I hope uh, you take up the challenge that when it's just a matter of satisfying a minimum requirement, go ahead, draw a line and plan. But if you actually want to learn whether or not your design is serving the needs of its users or in how well it's serving its needs and what you could do to improve it, then uh, test out and push these methods further so that we can do a better job of what we've been trying to do for centuries, but we need to do better than we've been doing. Uh, thank you for being collaborators uh, uh, because a lot of what I'm presenting here is only possible because of the work of students who've come before you. Uh, now it's your turn. So thank you very much and good luck in studio. <laughs>